Right, so we've gone from that bit. So what I think I'll do now is I'll read a bit of um, chapter four. The chapter four is the plan. And you've ever, ever wondered what happened to the pigeons in Trafalgar Square when old Ken said, right, we're going to get rid of this lot. A bit like he said about the cab trade, really, wasn't it? There might be a little simil similarity there. So, all right, okay. So this is called Chapter 4, The Plan. In a conference room in the centre of London, London, a dozen men and women sat around a large polished desk, drinking tea, coffee, water, and e eating copious biscuits of all varieties. As the crumbs fell from the half-eaten supplies lay on the shiny surface, surface with as many dropping to the floor, a feast for a flock of pigeons, one man spoke. <coughs> He coughed politely. Gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? He paused and looked around the gathering, realising his mistake. <laughs> and ladies. The, the embarrassed silence in the room was filled by a lone member still crunching a crispy oat biscuit. As you know, he began, looking disapprovingly in the direction of the munching, the cost of keeping Trafalgar Square clean and free from the effects of the pigeons have, um, on the square has increased for the fourth year in succession. I don't need to tell you that £560,000 is a large amount of money in these difficult financial times, with the added cost of the renovation of Nelson's Column reaching £2 million. We have to find ways to reduce the cost of maintenance and find some new savings from the budget. Again, he surveyed the gathering. A few of them eyeing the next biscuit they would take, hoping nobody else would wanted the same one. Current fiscal conditions demand it, he gestured to a short, thin man on his right with a large, big nose making him look like a hawk. Harris, you are the expert on pigeons. Give us your ideas. And adding to the fiscal burden himself, he swept the crumbs from the biscuits off the table and onto the deep-piled carpet paid for by the hard-working inhabitants of the great city. The odd-looking little man pushed his chair back as he stood, knocking it awkwardly against the chair next to him. Pigeons? Harris began and took a long pause as he appeared to be lost in thought, trying to cram a lifetime's knowledge of the subject into one sentence. Are a menace, he continued. In fact, my lord, your worship, uh, your highness, he was unfamiliar with the opulent surroundings of the recently refurbished grand government building and didn't know how to address the chairman of the meeting of the General Cleaning, Maintenance, Drainage and Sewage Committee. Um, he was a man from a different world to Harris, who spoke with a delicious clipped tone dressed in the finest woolen suit from Savile Row, and although he'd been moved sideways to the current department because of an embarrassing incident in the Home Office, and been fully paid up member of the Media Jerky Brigade, Junkie Brigade, hid his resentment well by calling many meetings and generally trying to make his new role as important as he. Some of the committee coughed nervously at Harris's awkwardness, others smirked and chuckled at Harris's discomfort, still keeping an eagle eye on their next biscuit. She's like the, um, the, like the bird inferences I've been putting in, eagle eyes and hawking them. I thought that was quite clever when I did that anyway. Harris was an outdoors man, a man who was more familiar with the gardener than his lordship. His life had been dedicated to bird, birds. He preferred them to people. Birds had simple needs, to be safe, warm at night and to be fed. They made no more demands on him than that. In his garden he had built a large aviary containing five pairs of Harris hawks. No pigeon fancier was he. His obsession was with the eradication of pigeons. They are no more than rats with wings and they should be destroyed, every one of them. He looked sternly around the room again, remembering the moment when he had first realised his hatred for these creatures, fixing his eyes firmly on the gentleman who dared to mock him. As a young boy, he was standing in his local market square, waiting for a friend he had arranged to meet. Unfortunately, his friend was not coming, as his friend was not his friend at all, and had only been teasing him when he said he would go out for the day with Beaky Harris Hawk his nickname back then. Harris was so excited about having a friend, his first ever, that he arrived at the clock tower in the market a whole hour early just to make sure he wasn't late. After waiting in the same spot for three hours, he was beginning to doubt whether Clive was going to come at all. He was heartbroken and crying by now, and just as he was about to leave and return home, dreading what his cruel parents would say to him for being let down, Clive walked around the corner with a couple of schoolmates, all with the same feelings towards the lonely boy. Clive had forgotten about his meeting with Hawkey, another nickname, and only remembered as he saw him, all of them sniggering at the fun of it. At that moment, a lone pigeon, high up on the ledge of the clock tower, turned around from where he was standing and did what, only, what can only be described as what pigeons do. From a great height, he let one go, he did a poo, 
He emptied the contents of his bow, which, with the aid of gravity, dropped quickly, stealthily and silently through the air and onto the head of little Brian Harris, making a very quiet splat sound on impact. Not only did it land onto his hair, but some of the excrement fell onto the edge of his beak nose with a last drop finishing just on the top of his by now quivering lip, still wet from his tears of disappointment, and seeped into his half-open shocked mouth. The taste was disgusting, causing the unfortunate boy to cough and splutter and spit with great force. The other boys laughed and laughed as they pointed at the unfortunate victim. Look at him, oh, they shouted across the road as they laughed. Even the pigeons think he's rubbish. And as they ran off to enjoy the rest of their day laughing about what they had seen and practiced what they would be telling, what they would tell everybody at school first thing on Monday morning, even Brian completely alone. Brian Harris was really crying now, a cry of humiliation, a cry of utter rejection and complete sorrow, which quickly turned to anger and hatred. Not for the boys who laughed at him, he would have done exactly the same to them, but for the unknowing pigeon high up on the clock tower. One day he thought people will say, he is a great man. Everybody will know my name and I will be known for getting rid of those rats with wings. His, determin his determination set indelibly that day. At that moment of total humiliation, Brian Harris set out his plan to rid himself of the cause of his sorrow and to him the cause was pigeons. His life changed direction that day and Harris let hate take full control of him. Back in the meeting he continued, he had got this far and he wasn't going to stop now. First, he continued, we need to get rid of the pigeon feed hut. He only, that only attracts the birds to the square. But Jack has been selling bird seed from that hut for 40 years, man and boy, said one man supporting the age-old tradition. In actual fact, his father and grandfather did the same, interrupted one of the older gentlemen sitting at the end of the table, remembering when he too had visited the square as a young boy and in his turn played his part in the same old age-old tradition. Yes, I know, said Harris. He and his family, by selling food to the tourists, have helped to make the situation worse. Harris kept a deep and piercing stare towards the man who had spoken up. You see those rats with wings eat the food and fly off to a window ledge or statue, wall or pavement. They don't care where they go and they really don't care where they go. Harris emphasised the where they go and again remembered that fateful day when he was a boy. And when they go, he again emphasised, the acidic deposit sits where it falls and if not cleaned up instantly it will eat into the very stones and slabs of this great city. My lord, we need to rid them square now. He spoke determinedly, taking a deep breath. <gasps> to do this, we need a two-pronged attack. Calmer now, he continued. First, as I've already said, we get rid of the feeding hut. Then, Harris was gaining confidence now, spelling out his plan. We need to stop the birds from perching on the ledges and statues. Do you know that two tons of that stuff was removed from Nelson's column alone when it was cleaned? That is two tons of rotting, stinking, acidic poo on the top of the statue dedicated to this country's greatest hero. Is that the way to treat heroes in this country, my lord? Is it? Harris again gave an evil stare to the man who spoke, and while holding the stare, followed a look around the whole table. I'm going to do this now. He did it like that. And he looked at them and he made them all scared. I've lost my place now. <laughs> Hang on a minute. That's it. Look, and the room is meeting the uneasy eyes of every member of the committee, daring any of them to snigger or mock. The rest of the gathering was by now silent. Not even a crunch from a biscuit could be heard. Harris thought them too scared to oppose anything, he said. He continued now brimming with confidence. Spikes. Spikes, questioned the chairman. Thousands of spikes placed around the edges of the ledges. Harris gave himself a little smile at the rhyme of the last sentence. Too small for us to be bothered about from the ground, but sharp and painful for the... He stopped himself using that phrase again. Pigeons. Just using the word was almost too painful for Harris. They will soon learn not to land on anything around here, and if there is no food for them to eat, there is no need for them even to be here at all. He looked around the room again. Can you imagine a fine summer's day with the heat crackling in the, in the air and the fountains issuing their contents freely? A soft breeze catches the droplets and gently carries them through the air and settling on the faces and bodies of the tourists as they enjoy the magical atmosphere of this fine location. And all without the presence of a single flying rat pecking and messing indiscriminately hither and thither. I love doing that. I always try but hither and thither in a story when I write because I think it's a lovely thither. Yeah. Harris was a very focused man, happy that his rehearsed monologue had gone without a hitch, a man with a plan. Then, as this was his main point, 
his reason for living, the culmination of years of sacrifice, years of plotting and planning, we bring in the Hawks. I'm looking over there now, I'm gonna give you the stare. Bit of feedback. Then, uh, we bring in the Hawks. See, I've done it again. Surely interrupted another man, this time questioning Harris's plan. That is a three-pronged attack. What? Squawked Harris, his frustration evident. He turned his head and kept his body perfectly still, fixing his gait. Directly at the man who spoke. Surely that is a three-pronged attack, sir, repeated the man, a little nervously. You said a two-pronged attack, but there are three prongs in your attack. Prong one, right, ridding the square of the food, hut. Prong two, the installation of thousands of spikes. And three, the hawks. That is a three-pronged attack, if ever I saw them, sir. A fork, a trident, or even a trilogy, you might say. Most of the gathering gave a soft smirk, sniggering under their breath at the misplaced passion of the strange-looking man. His moment of glory completely deflated, as always, by people who didn't understand or respect him. Harris composed himself and turned to the chairman, seemingly ignoring the last interruption. Are we, my lord, going to let these birds destroy our city, or are we going to keep and restore our city to the glory and beauty it deserves? He turned his head slightly and glanced out of the window, as if looking for inspiration, calming himself. He breathed deeply through the, his nostrils, and the sound filled the room. To do this, he paused again, we need to remove the pigeons, and my hawks can dispatch them more efficiently than any other method. The room was now silent after the earlier excitement. We can save the treasury millions of pounds by ridding the square of these pests, and once gone, the buildings will not suffer any further decay. Harris knew one thing, and that was that money talks, and he was going to stick to the, the savings that could be made. He knew that no one in the room could resist the words, money, saving, and treasury. Already expressions were changing as the committee warmed to the idea. Okay, gentlemen and ladies, said the chairman, still enjoying the sound of promotion to my lord by Harris. And feeling the polished steel blade on his shoulder already, he glanced super superciliously around the room. I think we have the gist of what Harris is saying here, and I think we should take a vote on his proposal. Harris kept absolutely still, not believing how easy this was turning out to be. All those who want to give Harris' plan the go-ahead, say aye. An animus, a unanimous aye filled the room. Is that for the two-pronged or the three-pronged attack, Mr Chairman? Asked the same man as before, eager to make a further humiliating swipe in the direction of Harris. Two members chuckled almost silently under their breaths, but the moment had gone and the joke had lost its impact and the room fell embarrassingly quiet. Harris sat down for the first time in his chair and sighed. The latest steps on his lifelong quest complete, he was finally going to get his chance.